it's interesting that I suppose I'm wondering um, whether how you get the balance right between us a, a, an increased emphasis on you know with the virus for example there's been such an emphasis on keeping everything very clean and free from all bacteria and we're we, you know we're all permanently sanitizing everything and I wonder where the balance is right because I get you know for example my mother well you know you need a bit of bacteria you need a bit of dirt you know we, we can't all be so yeah. so clean as we are now so I just wonder how you get that balance right when it comes to your immune system yeah I mean sadly COVID it was a new virus so two years ago, there was not much known about it and people were dying. So understandably, there was this huge um, reaction which brought in very, very strict and serious um, uh, things like uh, sanitizing literally everything that came through your litter box uh, and, and the lockdowns where we were not mixing and all, all of this. Um, to know the impact of that, I, I think it's too early. And also it will depend on what you did during lockdown. I wasn't sanitizing everything because I would wash my hands with soap and water because that's actually as sufficient. And I don't really like sanitizer because I think it's it's um, having that eroding effect on our microbiome. So, and but some people were at the opposite end of the spectrum. So I think to get a, a scientific study you'd have to have a group of people and try and minimize confounders it's it's quite difficult to to measure but I would say to people that you know public hygiene and um, personal hygiene and, and public health measures have always been important you know we've had um, coughs and sneezes cause diseases that's been around for generations um, but we maybe went to an extreme degree when we didn't know what we we're dealing with with COVID but now we know much more two years on the picture is different hand washing is still important tissue etiquette is still important but I don't think we need to be sloshing around the sanitizer uh, as much as <laughs> we were encouraged to at a certain point bathing in it that's really, <laughs> really interesting okay I'm gonna reluctantly there's so much to ask you I'm gonna not you know move to some audience questions um particularly because um this first one from Charles is, is something you talk about in the book really interesting um glad to get to it which is how about supplements versus natural sources from fruit and veg I know you say mostly food but sometimes supplements so yeah what, what yeah and I have a little section on the book uh, you know I'm, I'm definitely not against supplements at all and I do make lots of little suggestions uh, for different supplements for different things in the book but I have a little thing of like do you need them because quite often I do feel like we get ruled in with this alluring marketing and it's quite nice to think we could have a little back door to well-being um, and it gives us a sense of agency over our health we're spending money on something so you almost get that placebo effect well it must be working mustn't it if we have that self-belief that it's working but do you actually know if it is you'll probably never know. Um, I think food brings something that supplements can't yet bring us. Uh, and that is, you know, these plant fibers that the gut microbes are breaking down. We can, um, there are fiber supplements, but they probably don't give you that breadth of different diversity of fibers that you would get from, um, you know, a really delicious, diverse, um, plant-rich, minimally processed meal. Um, that being said, you know, there's many reasons why people might not be getting all the nutrients they need. Um, maybe it's not for want of trying, but life's just busy and they're struggling to, to get everything they need from their diet. You know, we also know that the quality of, of um, foods have changed um, through different production methods, or people may have to exclude certain foods because they're struggling with intolerances or allergies. Um, and you know, some is good, more isn't necessarily all, always better. There are studies showing that taking too much of certain supplements can actually be associated with negative health outcomes. So I think I would always suggest people to supplement wisely, um, do a bit of research or get some advice before you spend your money um, and, you know, put it in the context of, of your lifestyle. Um, if you're very stressed and busy, if you train really hard in the gym, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why a supplement might actually be really helpful for you. Um, someone asked, which is really interesting question, does the immune system change based on ethnicity? Um, my Chinese friend's family is lactose intolerant. I'm Indian and eat meat. Is there anything I need to voice, uh, avoid based on ethnicity? Do you know what? I think there, there hasn't been a great deal of research um, looking at that. I do, I, we, we are starting to pick apart, I, I mentioned earlier in the discussion about these um, 
uh, immunity genes that recombine in a really unique way. Um, they're called the, the major histocompatibility complex. It's, it's a really difficult thing to explain, but I, I have um, expanded on it in the book. And we do know that these uh, histocompatibility genes will sort of congregate in different areas of the world. Um, just through evolution, and they may offer better or worse resistance to certain infections. So with COVID, for example, they've been trying to map which uh, MHC genes um, might offer you more res resilience to infection. And so they're, they may map to geographical areas, but um, that's, I think, as far as we've got, really. I think it would be a really interesting area to look, to look at. Yeah. Um, um, let's move, we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. Um, what about thoughts on organic versus non-organic foods in immunity? Again, I think, you know, if your budget can afford to eat organic, um, then there may be small benefits, um, as long as it's not at the cost of other aspects of your health, because it can be um, substantially more expensive. There may be benefits in terms of the microbes that are living on that produce. So an organic apple, I think there was a study that showed it had a more diverse collection of microbes living on it than a non-organic apple. And when you're eating the apple, you're getting the benefit of the, the healthy, good microbes that are on that piece of produce as well so there may be small benefits and also I think the field of um, things like pesticides you know we have a lot of regulations but whether they're uh, tight enough whether we know really the effect of certain um, uh, pesticides when they're put together with other pesticides and the volume that we might be consuming I don't think we know yet so I guess it's it's it would be great if we could all eat organic but it shouldn't be at the expense of you know other aspects of your health because it can be quite expensive um uh, more more question on the on the sort of eating front um I've heard the thing about eating 30 different fruits and vegetables a week I thought it had to be 30 grams um or more a week with which with herbs you're unlikely to get are you able to give an idea of how much um we need for our microbiome yeah i think it's 30 grams of fiber per day so that's slightly different um there's a few different statistics that have come out of large studies over the last few years so it's um the 30 different plant foods across a week means um literally 30 different types of plants but not just fruit and veg because i've also had people come so it's really hard to eat 30 different fruits and veg but then you can also throw in some beans some lentils you know herbs and spices count as like a half of one of your 30 um you know so it doesn't just have to be uh fruit and veg and then in terms of your daily fiber intake we're supposed to aim for um, 30 grams of fiber per day. And that's quite hard to, if you're not used to weighing out food and looking on the packet. Um, but generally in the UK, we only get about half of that in our diet. So that is again, just from bulking up your plants, but it's also from things like whole grains. Um, so that's another source of fiber. So there's sort of two different statistics. So it's the 30 grams of fiber a day, and then the 30 different plants per week. And if you kind of stratify that across, then you're going to have to eat a diet that's rich in plants, minimally processed um, in order to meet those targets. And you're crowding out then the, the, the opportunities for the, the more ultra processed foods. Um, we didn't talk about movement and exercise um, much. And somebody asks, I've noticed weakening in my arms due to aging. Will any amount of exercise or just using my arms, housework, etc., help with the immune system? Yes, definitely. Um, I'm very much uh, an advocate of just move, just move your body more, move your body in lots of different ways, move your body as much as possible. Um, because we get really caught up on like, movement has to be done in a really structured way, like in the gym. Uh, and I know myself as somebody who works and has two kids, like if I waited till I got to the gym to do any exercise, I probably never get to the gym because life can be quite hectic so you just have to find ways to to bring that into your um to your day into your week break up times of sitting you know do some push-ups off of your kitchen worktop while you're waiting on the kettle to boil 
you know, try balancing on one leg. It try and personalize it to where you are at, what your age is. Get some some tins of um, legumes, for example, that you're going to make your fiber rich dinner with, you know, and you can uh, do some arm workout with that. Uh, cleaning, tidying up, gardening, anything where you're really using those muscles because it does get harder as we get older. The body will naturally um, um, have that muscle shrinking happening and you have to sort of really fight to, um, to, to prevent it from doing that. And I always think, you know, tomorrow starts today. It doesn't matter how small, but if you don't start, you won't get those little benefits all, all building up. Um, somebody says, and I think this will extend to various other people's thoughts. She says, I enjoy a gin and tonic usually twice a week. I'm worried about the, a different, a separate, um, to her, a specific problem, um, slight arthritis in my thumb joints. These are enlarged, but not painful. Should I cut out alcohol altogether to prevent this advancing? So I suppose you could answer that, but perhaps also people might have wider um, questions about alcohol and yeah and I mean I wish I could deliver the happy news but sadly it seems that alcohol is not good for our health uh, in, in many different complex ways um, but the other side of that is you know you you have things like the Mediterranean diet which includes a small amount of alcohol in it in the context of you know enjoying a glass of wine with friends and so it comes back down to that aspect of the enjoyment you get from that small um drink that you have occasionally might actually be really good for your well-being and imagine taking that away and thinking feeling like something's been taken from you uh, that little bit of joy has been taken from you and so i would say you know think about the rest of your diet and lifestyle um are, is there things you can improve in other areas um thinking about a really like strong and anti-inflammatory diet pattern something like the mediterranean diet you know um supplementing with omega-3 fish oils or antioxidants uh, maybe reducing the measure of the gin or having it once a week just to kind of find that balance between you know a little bit of joy in life and uh, you know that the alcohol doesn't seem to be um something that is beneficial in any amount sadly um but that's for many reasons it, it tends to not be very good for the gut barrier and the gut microbes so it can sort of trigger inflammation it tends to affect our sleep even though we might feel like we go off to sleep very well after an alcoholic drink it we tend to not have that deep restorative sleep um and when we're poorly slept we tend to reach for um the more sugary foods the next day because our blood sugar response is kind of all out of kilter and we tend to over consume calories so you've got that kind of trickle down effect that happens um from drinking alcohol but then I, you know you've got to put it in the context of everything and how much alcohol so for a small amount in an overall healthy diet and lifestyle maybe that joy is is more important um so and another Oh, well, um, this is a really interesting question. So there's one, I think, which we've answered. Um, but Christine says, um, does gender have effect on immunity? Women live longer in almost every country and have for a long time. Yes, that's a great question. And um, we've known for quite a long time that men seem to fare worse with um, infections, but women get more autoimmune diseases. So about 80% of people with autoimmune diseases are women and um, our immune cells have receptors on them for the different sex hormones testosterone progesterone um, uh, oxytocin estrogen so they're being influenced by the different combinations of sex hormones that are in our body and we see variations across um, the monthly menstrual cycle in terms of immune function and certainly we see changes around things like menopause when estrogen tends to sort of fluctuate and then start to drop off and after menopause women's risk of infection seems to uh, become the same as men so for example with covid men were much more at higher risk of severe disease and women postmenopausal uh, postmenopausal women um, were had the same risk as men unless they were on hormone replacement treatment which seemed to continue that protective effect so estrogen in particular seems to protect women from severe infections um, but I think there's a lot more research needed in this area to really sort of understand this uh, a little bit more. It's um, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I think many people would be sort of wondering about, about um, how 
different things obviously we've touched on I think you know affect um affected which which are out of our control um I I think you've really probably answered this but somebody was asking about um arthritis and particular foods that may help that um and I'm just going to see this so we can sort of get all we've got a just a very kind of quick minute or so left but also if you um, might answer Sam's question is there a reliable way to test for vitamin deficiencies or intolerances to certain foods um, yes. yeah that's a tricky one so some vitamins and uh, minerals can you can probably get a test from perhaps your GP um, or there's a few companies that have popped up where you can just um, get a blood test and they will measure certain levels of vitamins and minerals not all of them are going to be able to be measured so uh, and some of them you're measuring like a kind of marker of that vitamin but it doesn't exactly tell you the whole story of what's going on um and then the intolerances thing so there's a big difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance if you have an allergy it's probably to one of eight or nine things so like eggs and shellfish and tree nuts and peanuts and milk um you know this kind of big allergens that you see now um often labeled on menus intolerances are different so an allergy you need to not be exposed to that food at all even a tiny tiny invisible speck could set off um an immune response and make you very sick and that normally happens very quickly after ingesting the food now when intolerance means your body's not tolerating that food um people often blame the food and exclude the food but actually it's a problem with your body and you have to kind of work on that tolerance um particularly if it's things like um vegetables which a lot of people suffer with uh, an intolerance to or or uh, beans pulses legumes it might mean that your microbiome just struggling to cope with digesting them but then there's sort of interventions you can do to sort of work on your microbiome but to really know if a food is linked to certain symptoms the only way to do that would be um, to work with a, a, a nutrition professional take a food diary do an intervent do a, um, a exclusion trial where you remove that food for a certain period of time and then reintroduce it and see if you've got any change and you have to be really meticulous and only remove one food at a time be, be sure to write it all down because otherwise you'll never know what's causing what and it all gets a bit muddied so um this is like doing your own n of one experiment really um the time has raced by um thank you so much i think we've got through all the um audience questions but people who, who we haven't they'll be certainly um able to find them in the book so thank you all very very much indeed for joining and jenna thank you so much really useful uh, thank you for for having me and it's been so lovely to have uh this conversation and thanks to all the attendees tonight and for the great questions